Jews, again, it's made in the flesh by hand, that at that time you were without Christ. Before you came to the Lord, you obviously were without Christ. Aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. You didn't have the blessings that God gave the nation of Israel. Strangers from the covenants of promise. The promises given to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and others. You had no hope of salvation. And you were without God in the world. Those are the Gentiles before Christ. But, here's another important but, verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Isn't that great news? The blood of Jesus Christ has brought the Gentiles near, near to God, and the Jews near to God as well as they come to Him. Remember now with circumcision, this whole thing about the physical circumcision, it had to do with a picture. Whenever God has a physical right, R-I-T-E, He is looking for some spiritual deeper application. Communion is not just bread and a cup, right? It's talking about the body and the blood of Christ. Baptism is not just going under the water. It's a picture of the death, burial, resurrection. And so the circumcision, the cutting away of the flesh of the male penis on the eighth day was a picture of the cutting away of the flesh of our lives, the sinful part of our lives. And the Bible talks about a circumcised heart talks about a circumcised hand, a heart that is for God, not for the flesh, a hand that does good, not evil, and so forth. And now he's going to talk in verses 14 through 18 about the fact that we're all one body, being Jew and Gentile. Verse 14, For he himself is our peace, who has made both one, and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you, who were far off, and to those who were near. For through him we both have access by one Spirit to the Father. So here we see this coming together of Jew and Gentile. The warfare, the enmity that took place for so many years, ever since the law was given to Moses. Actually, it goes further back than that. The enmity between Jew and Gentile really goes back to Abraham, Remember the first child was Ishmael from the servant Hagar and the second child was Isaac through Sarah. And remember the warfare there and Ishmael was uh, jealous no doubt and sneered at the baby, Isaac being weaned and the party for him. And Sarah said, get that child out and get that mother out of here. They will not share with my son. And God said to Abraham, so it is. Remove them. From then on, and that goes back about uh, oh, 4,000 years ago. 4,000 years. 2,000 years before Christ, 2,000 years since. That warfare has been going on. It came together 1,000 years ago <coughs> through the death of Jesus Christ. God said that warfare ceases, that enmity ceases. <coughs> we will now have peace through my son, Jesus. So verse 14, Jesus is our peace. Not just that he brings peace, he is peace. And that's an important distinction. To say he brings peace means ask him to give you peace, but he himself in his presence becomes your peace. You can't have peace without him. The United Nations will never achieve peace until Jesus Christ becomes Lord and Savior of all the world. That's why we don't need that kind of peace that man's trying to put together. He himself is our peace. He has made both one, that's Jews and Gentiles, and he has broken down the middle wall of separation. He's abolished in his flesh. By going to the cross and dying physically, he abolished the enmity or the hatred between the Jew and the Gentile. And it's based on the law of commandments contained in ordinances. The Jews hated the Gentiles because they had the law and the Gentiles didn't. 
and they were endeavoring to keep the law and the Gentiles weren't. And the Gentiles hated the Jews because they didn't have the law and the, Gent the Jews were being arrogant about it and on and on. And so that enmity was all abolished by the death of Christ on the cross. And he created in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. How do you make a Jew and a Gentile one? Jews were trying to get the Gentiles to become Jews. That was a big issue. Gentiles might have wanted Jews to become Gentiles. God said, we're not going to do it that way. We're not going to make a Jew a Gentile or a Gentile a Jew. We're going to create a whole new man. It's going to be called a Christian, a follower of Christ, someone who's born again. And a Jew can become a born again Christian and a Gentile can become a born again Christian. And that's where the peace comes. That's where the compromise is. In verse 16, he wanted to reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. So he wanted for the Jews and the Gentiles to come together in one body, the body of Christ, through the cross of Jesus Christ, and he put to death the enmity, this time not the enmity between Jew and Gentile, the enmity between man who is unrighteous and God who is holy. So Jesus Christ on the cross abolished that hatred between the Jew and the Gentile, brought them together in his own body, and then abolished that enmity between man and God and God and man by taking care of the sin on the cross. What a tremendous job he did. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off, Gentiles, and to those who were near, Jews. For through him we both have access to one spirit or by one spirit to the Father. So it's through Jesus Christ that both Jews and Gentiles have access by one Holy Spirit to God the Father. So notice the Trinity there in verse 18, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then finally he says, regarding our oneness, we talked about one body in verses 14 through 18. Let's close with a discussion of one building, verses 19 to 22. He says, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. So, you and I are part of the building or the temple of God. Verse 19, you're no longer strangers and foreigners, referring to the Gentiles. You're no longer outside the family of God to the Jews, but your fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. So God sees our relationship in Christ as fellow citizens and as members of the same household. We shouldn't be fighting each other as Christians. We shouldn't be jealous of each other. We shouldn't be having our denominational attacks of one another. Uh, you've had siblings in your family, remember that? Your parents said to your, your, have peace with your brothers and sisters. Do you have brothers and sisters? Did you get into squabbles? Did your parents allow that to happen? Oh, no, no. My mother used to say, my brother and I would fight, and she'd say, he was like five and I was like eight. And we'd have this big argument, and once he took a snow shovel and got it right across the eye, and uh, bad boy. And uh, mother used to say one thing, and I used to hate those words. She said, now hug each other's neck. You don't want to hug your brother's neck when you're in the midst of a fight. I hated that. <laughs> hug each other's neck. We did, though, because now we want, what didn't want to, but when Mama said do something, we did. I've often said if I were a five-star general in the Army, she'd have six stars. She was the mother, and she was the general, and she'd say, do it, we did it. And it was good counsel. We remained good friends all of his life and mine. I look forward one day to being in heaven and hugging his neck again. In any event, we are fellow citizens. We are members of the household of God. We've been built, verse 20, on the foundation 
of the apostles and the prophets. They were the first ones, the disciples of Jesus, those early prophets in the New Testament. They did the teaching. They did the foundation of the church. And the Jesus Christ, of course, himself is the most important stone. He's the chief cornerstone. In those days, the chief cornerstone was not just the ceremonial stone. Today, it's more of a ceremonial stone where you see the stone at the law school or the pharmacy or the medical center, and it's got the name of when it was laid and who made, paid the most money to have it built. But this cornerstone was the most important stone. It was the stone that was in the corner. It was the first stone laid on which all of the others had to be alive. It had to be laid perfectly, and all of the other stones had to be laid exactly in line with it. And so that is a picture of Jesus Christ in our lives today. And you and I, as we are in the body of Christ, shouldn't be looking at each other because we are really fellow stones, Peter says. We should be looking to the cornerstone for our lives. I'm not perfect, but I know I'm better than Joe Schmo. I know I'm not the most honorable and loving person, but I'm better than Sally. So no, you don't do that. You look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith, and say, Lord, may I be like you. Live your life in me. So he becomes the chief cornerstone in whom, verse 21, the whole building, that's all of us, being fitted together, put together carefully, placed together in this building, we grow into a holy temple in the Lord. We are a very important building like no other building in this world. We are the temple of the Lord, not only individually the temple, but corporately as well, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God and the Spirit. So every single Christian is being brought into this building, placed like a carefully placed stone in that building, and we are not only the temple of God, we are the dwelling place of God in the Spirit. We are not only His building, He's the place where He lives. So, where does God live on earth? He lives in me, in you, in reach out. Do we include anybody else besides reach out? The whole body of Christ, worldwide, past, present, and future. We are his home, and we are to conduct ourselves accordingly. Amen? Amen. So what a wonderful message that Paul gives us here in Ephesians 2. We are saved in Jesus Christ from a horrible past of death. We are brought into the present with a wonderful life of being made alive and raised together with him, sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And we are saved by his grace to do good works. It applies to Jews and to Gentiles. And every person who comes and trusts in Christ is brought into this body, into this building, in order to bring glory to God. More importantly, a place for him to dwell and live. Is that good news? That's wonderful news. Let's bow our hearts, shall we? Father, we're so grateful for this chance to have looked into your word this morning to see our salvation. Lord Jesus, we thank you that we don't have to and we can't work our way into salvation. It was done by you 2,000 years ago at the cross. Thank you, Lord, that by grace we're saved through faith. And that, not of ourselves, it's the gift of God, not of our works, lest anyone should boast. But Lord, we don't sit back and just begin to marinate like a fine piece of meat. We are really saved to serve, to get out there and to share the good news with others. Not fearful of losing our salvation, but grateful that we're secure in you. And grateful that the same mercy and kindness and goodness that was afforded us is available to any man, woman, or child who will say yes to you. Use us, Lord, to bring others from death to life with the precious word of God, salvation through Jesus Christ, by grace, through faith. In your name, Lord. Amen.